Thank you, Dan. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. Uh, I want to start by presenting a very broad overview of invasive species in the Northeast. One of the things I find very frustrating about working in this, this, uh, this area of invasive species is uh, sometimes the issue is perceived as, as so big and so complicated and so hopeless that even uh, among professionals in our, our field, that, 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 you know, there's this feeling that, that there's nothing that we can do or people end up uh, using the complexity of the issue as an excuse for inaction. Or sometimes you even find people working at cross purposes. And I'm going to suggest today a simple framework that, that might help us think about how to organize information about invasive species and how to manage them. And uh, I'm coming from the Mid Hudson Valley in southeastern New York, so most of the examples that I'm going to talk about today are from the area I know, my backyard in southeastern New York. And I, I think that the lessons, though, are, are general enough that they apply at least throughout the northeastern United States. And I'm afraid that with the passage of time and with the progression of climate change, many of the species from my backyard that I'll be talking about today are going to be in your backyard up here tomorrow. So, uh, the, the, the inspiration for my talk comes from an old song by Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson said that it, he was really only bothered by the loss of his ex-lover ex on three days. Only three days this bothered him. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And those three days, I think, are, are also a useful way to think about, about invasive species, the species that came here yesterday, the species that are coming here today, and the species that are going to come here tomorrow. So here's a, a, a quick outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about those three groups of, of invaders yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So I'll give you some examples of each. Uh, talk a little about the ecological effects the, that, are, that are happening on the ground there, but likely to happen in the future. And talk about uh, some some ideas about management actions. And I have to say, my um, take on management is likely to be very naive. I'm a, an ivory tower scientist, and so I'll be interested to hear the later talks from people who are not ivory tower scientists, and also your, your Q and A later to put me on the right track. So yesterday's invaders. Uh, these are species that arrived a long time ago and are well established in our landscapes, often widespread familiar parts of our uh, communities. Uh, I'll show you in a minute uh, that, 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 that non-native species began arriving in our area a long time ago, centuries ago. Many of them are already here on the ground. Many of them are already well established, at least down where I'm from they are. And some of these species have beneficial effects and some of them have uh, harmful effects, which complicates their management. So uh, I, I'm going to show you this graph a couple times today. I kind of like it. A few years ago, Ed Mills and uh, Mark Shirell and Jim Carlton and I put together an inventory of all of the invaders in the fresh waters of the Hudson River Basin. And we tried to put together a list of all the species, when they arrived in the area, um, how they got here, where they came from, and kind of what they're doing ecologically. So this shows our best guess at the time course of when these species arrived. So on the x-axis, it's just time from 1820 forward. And on the y-axis is the cumulative number of invaders that are established in fresh waters of the Hudson River Basin. This includes both plants and animals. And, uh, and you know, as I said, I'll show you this a couple times through the course of the talk. What I, the, the first thing I want to emphasize is invaders arrived and established themselves in the wild as far back in the past as we can see. We can see back to about 1810. There aren't really any records of any use to us before 1810. And already by the mid 19th century, we had you know dozens of uh, invaders that were that were here, established and spreading in freshwaters of the Hudson River Basin. And today, these species are some of the most commonly encountered uh, species that you find in any of the landscapes of southeastern New York. So if you go out in terrestrial environments, whether it's your your yard, where you're going to see dandelions and Japanese beetles and starlings, or when you go into the woods and you encounter a beech bark disease on the upper right, or garlic mustard on the lower left, or a, a Japanese barberry here in the, in the lower center, you, you will see, it, it, it's almost impossible to go into a landscape itself in the east of New York and look around you and, and not see non-native species. This is equally, equally true for aquatic environments. So we have species like the Eurasian invasive clones of Phragmites on the left, uh, 
purple blue stripe on the upper right, common carp and brown trout. So these are species that are widespread and common and very well established in the wild. So what should we do about these? Um, it, I'm a little surprised how often I hear two extreme views about what we should do about, what I think are extreme views, about what we should do about these. Some people say, well, they don't belong here. They're bad. They should, we don't want them. We'll kill them all. And then uh, about equally frequently, you hear people say, they're here. They're well established in the landscape. They've been unfairly demonized by the press and by biologists. We should embrace them. We should learn to love them. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, as, as you will see already by the way I'm setting this up, I don't think either of those is a very defensible view. And uh, let me explain why. Uh, the problem with the learn to love them is that a lot of these species are just pests. They cause problems. So none of the species in this picture, Japanese beetles, Dutch elm disease, uh, garden slugs, probably, have that, that many fans. Um, and, and, and they cause large economic problems. These are our estimates of economic damages in the United States just from these species that I've listed here. And if you haven't considered the economic impacts of invasive species, some of these numbers might kind of set you back in the chair a little bit because we're not talking about like $120 or even $120,000. We're talking about millions to billions of dollars a year in economic damages from these species. There have been a couple of attempts to look at a sort of nationwide cost of invasive species. These are very soft numbers, and I won't defend them as being the right numbers, but they're, they probably have the right number of digits in the, in the answer to give us an idea of how big this, the costs are, the ecological and economic costs of these species. <coughs> so about 10 years ago, a, a Pimentel a group at Cornell estimated that that non-native species cost the U.S. economy 138 billion a year. 138 billion would be a year. And again, I'm not going to say that that's the exact right number. Maybe it's 122 billion. Maybe it's 157 billion. Maybe it's even 85 billion. All of those numbers are large enough to catch your attention. 138 billion a year is a dollar a day for everybody in the United States, and a little bit more than that. So if you can imagine having a coffee can by your back door. Every day when you get out and go to your house for the first time, you put a dollar bill in there for everybody in your family. And at the end of the year, you set fire to that pile of dollar bills. That's what invasive species are costing you and you and you and me. So it's a big problem. Also, there's evidence that it's a big problem ecologically. The graph on the upper right is a famous graph that David Wilco had all did a few years ago. They went to the endangered species list in the United States. And in the recovery plans for the species, they list what's, what problems put the species on the endangered species list. And not surprisingly, the biggest uh, cause of endangerment of U.S. species is habitat loss. But number two, ahead of over harvest, ahead of pollution, ahead of any of the other factors, uh, are non-native species. So we can see that the problem with the learning to love them uh, response to not to invasive species is that, uh, is that they're costing us so much economically and ecologically that it's not a very, for me at least, not a very palatable uh, response to the problem. At the same time, the kill them all has got some problems. Uh, a number of species were introduced here because they were thought to be desirable, and they're still thought to be desirable. Most of the freshwater game fish in southeastern New York, uh, and quite a few of them here in the Outer Index, I believe, as well, Certainly in southeastern Europe, most of our uh, freshwater game fish are not native. So uh, largemouth and smallmouth bass were brought here, the rainbow and brown trouts, uh, uh, several important panfish, the walleye. These are fish that are all were brought here and are non-native. And uh, some people would try to be pretty upset if we said we were going to try to eradicate all of those species from southeastern New York. And then in addition, there's a very large group of species that you can say have mixed effects that, that these are species that are well established. And on the one hand, you say, well, uh, purple loose stripe crowds out native wetland plants, um, common carp uh, muddies up waters. But at the same time, uh, purple loose stripe is an important source of uh, uh, flowers for honeybees. And uh, common carp is actually, among many anglers, considered to be a very desirable fish. In the Hudson River, it's the 
pin fish that is most often kept, the you know, highest percentage of take of any species of fish that's caught by anglers in the river. So there's a large class of species, depending on who you're talking to and what ecosystem and when, uh, you might think of as being uh, good or bad or, or, or some of each. The additional problem, the real practical problem, the kill the ball approach, is we don't have the tools to kill the ball. So even if we decided to vote unanimously at the end of this meeting, this august group, uh, that we want to kill all of the invasive species in New York State, uh, right now we don't have the tools to do this. So uh, it costs us money. Uh, in many cases, control or eradication programs are, are long-term enterprises. Sometimes they're just plain impossible, and sometimes the tools that you use to manage these species may have side effects that, uh, that are problematic. And, and, and I'm not speaking against managing, controlling, or eradicating invasive species. I am simply saying that it's not always possible just to take a hammer out of our toolbox and, 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 and eradicate all these species. It's a hard problem. Let me uh, give you one brief example here to show you what I, what, what I mean by this. This is, this is one of my least favorite plants, personally. Uh, I know I shouldn't let my personal feelings uh, get involved in this. This is water, it's a water chestnut. It's a Eurasian plant. that was brought over to North America deliberately because it was thought to be a desirable ornamental. This is one of the bays on the Hudson River, a few hundred acres of this stuff. Uh, you can't get a boat through this. You can't swim in it. Uh, you can't uh, wade through it. Uh, it, it's a, it, it, it crowds out uh, native plants. It, uh, early on, it was recognized as an undesirable plant in New York. And, and the state spent 60 years trying to eradicate it from the Hudson River uh, using both mechanical removal and a 2,4-D fly from airboats. Uh, this was a pretty intensive campaign. Uh, cost some money. Uh, they were able to knock back the beds over a course of 60 years by 60%. And then the control effort was given up partly because of the change in herbicide regulations and partly just because priorities in New York State uh, changed. So the water chestnut came back. So this is an example where uh, control or eradication isn't straightforward. Uh, it's a long-term effort. And, and then once the pressure is, is, is taken off of the control, the, the, the species comes back. Another interesting thing that has happened with water chestnut is a group of us at, at the Institute of Ecosystem Studies have <coughs> been studying its actual ecological impacts. It's not surprising that a plant that forms continuous beds like this would have large ecological impacts. But these impacts were not studied or demonstrated before control was started. Right? So what we found, uh, can I walk away from the podium without losing the exact Okay, so we found that there actually has large, complicated ecological impacts. The, the, the really important one, besides the impenetrable aspect of the recreation, is that this canopy is so dense that if you put a light meter underneath that canopy right now, in the middle of the afternoon, the summertime, it's darker than night underneath that canopy. It's darker than night. There's no light at all that gets underneath that. You can see that here's light. Here's your, this is a comparison of conditions in a water chestnut bed versus the native water celery that it displays. So you see a big decline in light. What that drives is a huge decline in dissolved oxygen underneath this water chestnut bed. We all learned in third grade that plants produce oxygen. So why is there no oxygen underneath this water chestnut bed? It's because the plant is releasing oxygen into the air in as dark as night underneath that canopy in the water. So there's no photosynthesis water, but just a lot of respiration by the water chestnut stem and roots by the bacteria and the plants that are trying to live in the water column. So in this particular water chestnut bed, it goes to near zero oxygen uh, every day during the summer. And so that's what you need. So those seem bad, right? Those have no recreational access, low, low oxygen. But there's some other things the plant is doing that seem good. So it also removes a lot of nitrate. Nitrate is an important pollutant of coastal waters. And there's a lot of denitrification that occurs in these beds. That's the removal of nitrate, conversion to a harmless form of nitrogen. And uh, a lot of the water in the Hudson River now goes through a water chestnut bed before it goes to the ocean. And in the process of going through the water chestnut bed, nitrate is removed. You also see over here, there's a lot more plant biomass in the water chestnut bed than they 
guinea pigs, and a lot more invertebrate, a lot more invertebrate animals living there, including many species that are rare or absent from the native, uh, the native vegetation beds. Native species of insects that are rare or absent from the native beds. So this plant undoubtedly has some bad impacts, especially for human recreation, and it undoubtedly has some good impacts, the removal of nitrogen pollution from the water and the provision of habitat for invertebrates. And so uh, this is kind of complicated uh, as to whether and how we should control those. We also know that they, at least in the 60s, they were using the tools that were available then, it was a hard plant to, to control or eradicate. So one possible conclusion from this would be that you might conclude that you would, you would, instead of trying to do eradication throughout the Hudson River, you might try to manage it locally. So for example, you might try to cut channels through the bed that would provide oxygen and access to fish into the interior of the bed, and also allow people to go through the bed or uh, into the bed for fishing or whatever it is that you want to, want to do. So uh, I think that, that the reason I showed you that example is I think that that may be a sort of typical example of how we may want to treat uh, the yesterday's invaders. An actual assessment of impacts and some sort of management to address specific impacts. So I just said that, I don't have any stuff. So it seems to me that with yesterday's invaders, things that are well established, it would be useful to, for us to actually assess the actual impacts. Many times, uh, these impacts are assumed to be bad on the basis of very few data, very little information. It would be better, it seems to me, to actually study the impacts. Beside them, uh, whether control is desirable. This may involve reconciling the, the uh, views of multiple stakeholders. And if you decide you want to control it, decide whether you can control it. See what tools are in your toolbox. And again, I want to emphasize there is an important role for research and development for control of really bad invaders. We don't have enough tools in the toolbox right now for a lot of these problematic invaders. So we may decide that we really do need to get better tools of all kinds to, to, to control these. And then finally, if, if we want to control, and if we can control, then proceed to, to control. And again, I think this will often be locally based management directed to specific goals rather than something very general like uh, uh, region-wide eradication or kill them whenever you see them. Today's invaders, I want to move on to the next class of invaders. These are species that are established in the wild and spreading, but not yet everywhere on the landscape that they're going to go. And uh, what I'm going to conclude about these species is that, is that we're in a period of flux right now. We're, we're seeing a lot of new invaders every day. We don't know the impacts of these invaders as well as yesterday's invaders because they're just getting there. And then we have a different set of tools in our toolbox for today's invaders than we had for yesterday. And also, different considerations for cost-benefit for deciding whether to control these species. So back to this graph, I said I would show this to you a few times. Invaders, I said, started arriving a long time ago. You see the slope of this graph is almost a straight line. It's pretty interesting. That means the rate of invasion has been pretty much continuous since about 1810 And it's not healing over. That's what's important about this graph right now. If I show you uh, a lot of other environmental problems, like uh, air pollution emissions in the United States, or uncontrolled sewage in the United States, they, these graphs will heal over, right, as we control the problem. The fact that this graph continues to rise, this line continues to rise, tells us that a lot of them are are common, and that we have not yet controlled the problem. So we're seeing a lot of new invaders. And, 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 and this graph, for the Hudson Valley, right? But graphs like this uh, have been produced for all different parts of the world. The bottom uh, panels here are from an OTA study from, from the United States, about 1990, it's a little out of date. You can see these curves are all hot, rising, the number of invaders, these are actually concave upward, which means the rate of arrival of new species is not only high, but it's actually rising, it's getting faster and faster. And uh, the upper graph is from a study of Europe that was just and again, you see high and rising rates of invasion. So this is not just a, 
uh, problem in the southeast of New York in my backyard, but it's really a local uh, problem. When I'm talking about today's invaders, here are a few examples of the species I have in mind. The upper left, the, the scariest invader I can think of, uh, the Asian longhorn beetle, which has uh, been established in the wild several times in North America. It's currently established in Worcester and I think Boston as well right now. And there are very concerted attempts to eradicate this one before, we, uh, before it gets out of the bottom. The upper right is the famous silver carp or the jumping carp. If you haven't seen the videos of this, go home. Google uh, jumping carp video, and it's worth uh, five minutes of looking at these. This is the fish that caused all the problems in the last few months in Chicago, and to got people talking about closing the canal in Chicago, and the state of Michigan suing the state of Illinois, and so forth. In the upper left, kind of dark, this is the animal I actually work on, it's a zebra mussel, uh, an invader in, a, in, a, in the Hudson River and throughout North, much of North America. And in the right, an aquatic plant called hydrilla that's also popping up number of sites. Uh, this class of today's invaders, I think you can really think of as several indistinct classes of invaders. Uh, at the one end of the spectrum, we have things like the Asian longhorn beetle. They're just, just barely established in the wild and haven't spread very far. The blue dots show places where Asian longhorn beetles have been established in the wild. Most of these, thankfully, have been eradicated before they Spread. There is, as I said, a colony in Worcester, Mass, and one in Boston right now that, uh, the, 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 that we're trying to, to eliminate. So here's an invader that has the potential to spread very widely and hasn't, hasn't yet started spreading very much. And we have species like the silver carp that are actually pretty widely established on the landscape. The green dots show places where there are silver carp in the wild. But they haven't yet spread to cover the whole range yet. The dark red show areas that are mopped by the computer models suggest will be suitable for silver carp. And you see this species has the potential to become very widespread in North America and hasn't yet covered uh, that range. The third class of today's invaders are species like the zebra mussel. There are two species of zebra mussel in North America, shown here in different colored dots. You can see they're very widespread. Uh, they've covered uh, really big areas, uh, in, especially in eastern North America, but also now the west. But uh, when you see a map like this, it's easy to think, well, the game is lost. The species has already spread over the landscape. But actually, it's only spread to a small fraction of suitable sites. This animal appeared in North America in the mid-1980s. And what this graph shows is that in the Great Lakes states, there are many, many, many suitable lakes that are chemically and physically suitable for zebra mussels. That's the 100%. The blue line down here at the bottom shows the percentage of those lakes that actually contain zebra mussels. And even though this is a species that's pretty easy to move around, humans move around pretty effectively, and even though it's been on the landscape for about 25 years now, it has found its way to fewer than 10% of those suitable lakes. So, it still has a lot of range to fill, and we still have some options to either enhance, to get it, to, to that filling of the rest of the range, the filling of all these red, these red lakes here, can either be fast if we're careless, or it can be slow if we're careless. The other interesting thing about these new invaders is that it's much harder to, to evaluate their ecological impacts than yesterday's invaders. I said with yesterday's invaders, we just go out and study it. But the problem with today's invaders is they haven't been on the landscape long enough for us to, to really uh, estimate their impact precisely. So for example, the economic losses from the Asian longhorn beetle have been estimated anywhere from 40 billion to 2.7 trillion dollars. Those are all big numbers, they're all breathtaking numbers, but it's a real wide range. The other thing is that the effects of a new invader may change over time. And this is something our group has been demonstrating, studying in the zebra mussel effects in the Hudson River. So this is the density of native pearly mussels. These, some of you know these are uh, these are rare uh, they're, they're, native pearly mussels are endangered in a lot of places, not in Hudson, but in a lot of places. So this shows the density of pearly mussels in the Hudson River on a logarithmic scale. You see for the first seven years of the zebra mussel invasion, things were downward, downward, downward for the native mussels. In about the year 2000, that something happened. 
zebra mussels didn't go away. There's still as many zebra mussels as ever in the Hudson. But the impact on the native mussels reversed. And so with these new invaders, we still have the possibility that we're looking at a system that's still changing. And so it's hard to estimate their ultimate impacts. So what are our uh, control options? I said we had a few more tools in the toolbox for today's invaders than yesterday's. The first is eradication to beach beachhead particularly for species that haven't spread very widely, if we, can, if we can monitor to see, detect them when they first arrive, and we have the will and the money and the resources to go out and get them, we can actually eradicate them before they spread. And this is what we're trying to do with the Asian longhorn field. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to keep this animal from spreading across the landscape to kill the last one in North America. Because if we fail, it's going to cost us probably hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, this is a really, uh, if we want to do that, we have to get on the infestation right away when it appears in the wild, and we have to kill it right away. And the importance of rapid action is shown by this data set, really nice data set, that Marcel Raymonic put together. This is uh, invasive plant invasions in the state of California. On the x-axis is the size of the infestation when the control is started. It's a logarithmic scale. So this is less than a tenth of a hectare. That would be an infestation size of this room. And this goes up to more than 1,000 hectares. That's the 2,200 acres. So bigger infestations. On the, the, the black line shows how much effort it costs to try to eradicate these plant species. And you can see, not surprisingly, it rises in the tens of thousands of person days, uh, as sorry, person hours, as the infestation rises. The more sobering thing is the red bars show the number of those infestations that were successfully eradicated. And you can see that they were never successfully eradicated if the initial infestation was more than 100 hectares, 220 acres. So. Uh, what this says is that if you're really serious about eradicating things at the beachhead, you need to be on the beach observing the invader coming in, and you need to be ready to start action right away and not kind of discuss it and dither around and, 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 and wait for 10, 10 or 20 years for the infestation to move from this category over to that category. Another option we have is containment. So uh, for species that are well established but still spreading, sometimes we have choke points where we can prevent the spread of these species. So here again is the silver carp. We have artificial drainage connections, canals, that link the Mississippi River Basin with the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes with the Hudson River Basin. Here you go. And these are options where we could build barriers there disconnect the connections that allow the species to move across the landscape and then protect large areas of the landscape from, from these invaders. This obviously applies primarily to freshwater invaders rather than terrestrial invaders. And then we can have control at local containment. I showed you a minute ago the zebra mussels, even though they've been here for a long time, haven't gotten to all the susceptible waters. So we can use regulation and education uh, other tools to try to keep this uh, animal from spreading across the landscape. And this local containment is an option that we can use, again, mostly for freshwater invaders, but not entirely. I mean, I'm sure many of you saw the old firewood signs on, on your way up here today. I did it. And saw the purple uh, emerald lash borer traps along the roads. So even for terrestrial invaders, even if we can't have complete containment, we can slow the spread of a lot of these things across the landscape. So we have more tools in the toolbox. So to summarize the, uh, uh, the situation with today's invaders, these are uh, species that are not yet well established and spread across the landscape. We often are not really sure of their impacts. We have some idea what the impacts are, but we're not really sure. We have a few more control options. And here, time is of the essence. If we're talking about a species that has been dandelions. They've been on the landscape for hundreds of years. They've, they've spread everywhere they can spread. 
you know, if we spend a couple more years studying them before we control them, it's no big deal. For today's invaders, waiting is a big deal. So management options, uh, what I suggest is, you know, make, when, the, when the species first appears on the radar screen, we decide whether it's a significant risk or not. I think we have to adopt a lower bar for risk here than for established invaders because we don't, we, we can't be as precise about knowing what the impact will be. So the question is, what is the likely impact? But the question might be, what are the odds that it will have a big impact? Uh, assess our opportunities for eradication or containment. Again, we have a few more options than for yesterday's invaders. And uh, act quickly. And there's this important asymmetry with action here that biases us in favor of doing something instead of not doing something. By asymmetry, what I mean is this. Suppose we decide that we want to control, I don't know, a new species, strayers, earthworm comes into North America. And, and, and we decide we're going to control it. And then after a few years, we decide it's actually a charming little creature. And, and, uh, and, and we really would love to have it. We can always relax control and let it move across the landscape at that point. But if we decide at first that it's a charming creature, and we make a mistake about that, and let it, by this time, it's spread over six states, uh, we've lost our option for control. So all of this suggests to me that we should be biased in favor of action, in favor of moving for today's invaders. So let me go on to the last class, tomorrow's invaders. Here are my conclusions about tomorrow's invaders. We're looking at a future that unless we change the way we're doing business, uh, will involve a whole bunch of new invasive species uh, moving into our landscape in the coming decades. Some of these species surely are going to be harmful ecologically or economically. It's going to be hard to be precise about predicting impacts of the, of the, the species that are coming in the future. And our management and cost-benefit calculations are different yet for tomorrow's invaders than they were for today's or yesterday's. So again, this graph, uh, again, notice it's not healed over. So what's your projection for the next, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years? More invaders, right? The line is pointed upward. So I think that uh, we can conclude that unless we radically change the way we do things, we are going to continue to see more invasive species arriving in our landscapes. We have a pretty good idea about how invaders are arriving now uh, in, in, the, in the present day situation. So I'm sure some of you have already heard about this. We, get, we have a bunch of species coming in ballast water, ocean for the ships. We have the aquarium trade, the horticulture trade, bait buckets, agriculture, and so forth. In a general way, we understand pretty well what vectors are bringing species from other parts of the world into North America. I want to just show you a little more detail on a couple of these vectors to show you that this is a serious issue. So the aquarium trade. There's been some nice studies of aquarium releases in the city of Montreal. Just the city of Montreal, which is one city. These studies reckon that every year, people who are tired of the stuff in their aquarium release more than 10,000 fish into the wild, into the waters of Montreal, and more than 3,000 plants from all around the world into the city of Montreal. Thankfully, many of these dozens of species are from tropical countries, and they have no chance of surviving the Canadian winter. But I want you to think about, if, if there are 10,000 fish and 3,000 plants just in the city of Montreal, now think about the rest of North America, what those numbers must be. How many times, uh, this little game of Russian roulette that we're doing, how many times the fish will be able to survive in the Canadian winter or in the New York winter or in South Carolina? And so uh, we're seeing a lot of species moving around in the aquarium trade. The other really sobering thing is that, uh, is that many, when you buy one thing in the aquarium trade, you often get another species for free that you didn't order. I guess that would be possible to look at. There was a study a few years ago showing that 90% of mail order aquarium orders contain at least one more plant and animal other than the one you ordered. So there's a bunch of other things moving in this dirty trade right now. Ballast water. A lot of people, ballast water has gotten such a high profile in the past few years 
But a lot of people I talk to think that the problem has been solved. Zebra mussels came into North America and ballast water. Everybody said, well, this is bad to move ballast water around the world, so let's stop it. And we do have federal regulations that regulate uh, ballast water releases in North America, in, in the United States. However, uh, in the last year that I've seen data for, 2005, 22% of all ballast water came in untreated as an exception underneath, under that law. So we got 9 million tons of untreated ballast water coming into the United States in 2005. And then there are other exceptions. The sediments in ballast tanks are not regulated. So if you come in and say your ballast holes are empty, you don't have to do anything about treating it. Empty means just a little water and some sediment and a bunch of live creatures. So we haven't, uh, we haven't yet fixed even ballast water. Aquaculture is another one. Aquaculture is regulated at the state level. And cultured organisms, I said often escape because I'm trying to be conservative. I could have said always escape. Uh, cultured organisms almost always escape into the wild at some point. This is a black carp, the fish here is a black carp. It uh, was brought into the United States by the authority of the Mississippi Department of Agriculture over the objections of the 28 state, other states in the Mississippi River Basin, over the objections of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's now been caught in the wild, this escapes. It uh, will survive in New York if and when it spreads here. And, uh, and to me, it just makes no sense to have uh, you know, local regulations of what is, a, what is a national problem. We know, also know that, that many of tomorrow's invaders are going to cause us problems. We know this because we're seeing what's coming in now. So here's are things that are just either just appearing in North America or uh, are likely to appear. So we have the age one heart beetle. Uh, in the upper right, the dead fish there die from viral hemorrhagic septicemia, which is a viral disease that appeared a few years ago in the Great Lakes states. Lower right is sudden oak death, that's certainly a bad one. In California, and I understand our native eastern oaks are susceptible to that. This is a, uh, a golden mussel. It hasn't appeared in North America yet, but it will live in many of the waters that don't su support zebra mussels uh, in North America. And then I guess we're going to hear more about the white nose the syndrome in the past, which uh, my understanding is may or may not be. I, I, we'll find out about this tomorrow, I think. Uh, so my point is, is simply that, that many of these invaders are going to cause us problems. And, 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 and we do, again, have some more tools in our toolkit here. We understand which vectors are bringing these, uh, these, these species into North America, so we know how we're getting there. So we have the option of vector control. We can control ballast water. We can do a better job controlling what's moving in the pet trade. We can educate aquarium. There's a bunch of things that we can do uh, that, 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 that might be effective in preventing the arrival of tomorrow's invaders. The other important thing about tomorrow's invaders is it's very hard to estimate the impacts precisely. So uh, we can't, I can't even tell you the names of the species and when and where they're going to arrive. So it would be very hard for me to say in, in the year 2011, we will get invaders that will cause us $38 million in damage. It's a, to some extent, a, a, a random process. It's not very good to put. All of this suggests to me that we should be very, very aggressive. A weed that's spreading across the landscape. We have something called mile a minute in the, in the Hudson Valley that everybody hates. It's, it's really easy to motivate action because it's engulfing people's backyards and growing over their dogs and stuff like that. And, and it's a very concrete problem for but the problem of tomorrow's invaders is kind of an abstract problem. So what, what are you talking about? What species? Give me an example. How do we know that species is going to arrive here? And so I think that for our whole field, the idea of capturing the public imagination and the politician's imagination about uh, the importance of this issue is, is a difficult problem. I'd be interested to hear what people think about this, about how we can get people to take this prevention problem uh, seriously, take advantage of the opportunities that we have available to us. Okay, so let me try to conclude here. Uh, with again, with Willia, there is a reminder of the of the uh, of the framework. We have lots and lots of uh, non-native species in uh, both the freshwater and terrestrial landscapes here in the Northeast. Uh, some of the species cause problems. 
economic, ecological problems. Some of them have positive uh, effects. They, they're, they're, they, they have beneficial effects. Um, Well-established well invaders are, are really hard to control sometimes. Um, and I guess the, the, the central message I'm trying to convey to you, but not very well, I guess, is that the, the, the risks, the tools, <laughs> Uh, the appropriate management actions, the opportunities, all depend on the stage of the, of the invasion. And so instead of trying to lump together all invasive species together, I think it may be very convenient and helpful to think about yesterday's invaders, uh, today's invaders, and, and, and tomorrow's invaders. So thank you for your attention.